asked if that was at all possible. So we're going to give people a couple of minutes to come in and or a minute and uh, then we're going to get started. Looking forward to uh, this so much. Looking forward to questions from everyone who's participating and looking forward to engagement with anyone who has an interest afterwards uh, in this space or please find me later. I'm uh, This is a great group of people and I'm such a fan. So thank you so much. Yeah, and you were in... Uh, uh, I was in Charlotte. In Charlotte, yes. Yes, I was. I made a point so I would understand how people are thinking in this space and and what my and basically what my message should be to uh, this audience. So I will I will focus on a few points in particular tailored to this audience. OK, I think that we are going to uh, get started here and uh, some more people will be coming in, I'm sure, as I'm uh, introducing everything. Uh, but welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied fields uh, related to the built environment. Uh, and today we have an author's forum on the book Fragile Neighborhoods with Seth Kaplan, who is the author. And I'm Robert Studeville. I'll be the interviewer and moderator today. You can share your thoughts on hashtag on the park bench, www.tinyurl.com slash OTPB feedback. And you can join us for upcoming webinars. Um, we have one uh, that's another author's forum on the book Climate Resilience for an Aging Nation. And that's going to be on November 28th. Um, so you can go to cnu.org slash resources slash on the park bench to register and find out more um, about that one in other upcoming webinars. And of course, save the date, CNU 32 will be in Cincinnati, Ohio on May 15th through 18th, 2024. This historic river city has rebuilt its urban core, harnessing its own diversity to overcome adversity. Learn more at cnu.org slash cnu32. And today, uh, as I said, we have an author's forum and the topic is neighborhoods, particularly neighborhoods at risk and what we can do about them. Seth D. Kaplan is a leading expert on fragile states and has written a couple of books on that global topic. He is a professorial lecturer at, in the Paul H. Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, senior advisor for the Institute for Integrated Transitions and consultant to multi lateral organizations such as the World Bank, U.S. State Department, and U.S. Agency for International Development, as well as developing country governments and NGOs. This is an unusual resume for uh, a, a participant on the park bench. Um, but uh, Kaplan took that international expertise and applied it to neighborhoods across the United States. I'm Rob Studeville, editor of CNU's Public Square. Uh, Kaplan's book is Fragile Neighborhoods, Repairing American Society One Zip Code at a Time. Neighborhoods impact lives in many ways. They determine who residents know, what resources and opportunities they have access to, the quality of schools, and even how long people live. Too many Americans live in neighborhoods plagued by insecurity, loneliness, addiction, and despair. Even the wealthiest neighborhoods are not immune from problems. In Fragile Neighborhoods, Kaplan offers a bold new vision for addressing social decline in America. First, there's going to be a presentation, then a brief discussion, and then Q&A from the audience. So please use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask your questions as they occur to you. And now I'm going to pass this along to Seth Kaplan. Thank you, uh, Rob. I'm going to share my screen here. And let's just go to full screen. 
So uh, first, of course, thank thank you, Rob. Thank you, seeing you. And it was a great pleasure to go to the conference in Charlotte. I learned so much, and I hope to see people in Cincinnati next year. I I spent many years on this book because I have I live in many countries, and I think very much about why countries work or don't work. And I look at my own country and I'm very worried about our society. And I literally have spent years of my time and energy because I want to focus on our social fragility, why I consider it our number one domestic problem. And I want to talk a lot about the role of place. I want to talk a lot about what um, CNU members or other people listening to this can do to address what I would call our social crisis. First, I want to give you some background. I have, for most of my adult life, basically wandered, first wandered the world and then worked across the world. I have been in 75 countries. I have worked in, I don't know, about 35 countries, depends how you define that. I currently work on Libya not in green there because you can't go to Libya and be safe. Uh, I work on Nigeria where I used to live and have been uh, many, many times. I'm working on Ukraine. And as you can see, I, I work on a lot of countries and I think really hard about society and how that affects politics, how that affects the economy, how that affects the well-being of people in countries. And this is some of the products that first book on the left, that was my 2008 book, the first book on fragile states. It basically uh, put me on the map in the fragile state space where I have, where which is my day job, my professional life. And uh, that did very well. Pathways for Peace is the only, the single and only report ever put out by the United Nations and World Bank. These organizations typically don't work together. They combined for this report 2018, because of rising violence in the world and what we could do about it. I'm senior advisor. And the right is a sample of the work. I work for the Institute for Integrated Transitions, which is 11 years old and works in about a dozen countries with about 30 staff and 300 people in our various networks. So that gives you some idea of our background. I would just say that the most important thing I learned from all this work is that relationships matter not only to individuals, but to the well-being of societies and countries. I wrote this book because in 2015, 2016, 2017, in Washington, D.C., where I live, everybody knows me as the fragile states person. And people basically ask me over and over again, is America a fragile state? You can imagine me at a coffee shop right near Farragut Square or some other place, DuPont Circle in Washington, talking to people I know, they, they're familiar with my work, and they're there trying to figure out what is going on in the United States. Clearly, the politics of the country was worrying them, bothering them, making them anxious. It was a time of great anxiety. And people kept asking me, are we a fragile state? And I had just come back from Sri Lanka or Nigeria or the Horn of Africa. And this question didn't quite make sense. But I felt it was something I had to answer because the question came up so many times. Uh, and what you do is if you look at this question, what is wrong with our society? And what are the wh what is the reason we are having so many social and also political problems? There's a lot of questions, but there aren't a lot of answers. There are loads of books. When I finished uh, writing this uh, book and I took my collection of books and I wanted to put them someplace, I had to buy a bookcase. Uh, my wife did not want that bookcase in the living room, but I needed to put it someplace. And there literally is not a bookshelf. There's a bookcase of books lamenting the problems of American society, lamenting, uh, diagnosing these problems. I mean, people know Bowling Alone and they know other books of Robert Putnam, but there are there are dozens of books, and I've only read some of them. I read the most prominent of them. And I would say a lot of these books are great. None of them tell you what to do about the problem. For the most part, they end with we need family dinners. We need to have more dialogue. We need to meet more often. We might need more third places, places where you can gather. They're not very good on solutions. 
I mean, here's a quote from Bob Putnam. I believe this is from Bowling Alone. Basically, they're all saying that our relationships have declined. And I think it's important to understand it's not just that our relationships have thinned, it's the institutions behind or underlying the relationships that have thinned. It's very important that we think about the thinning of our relationships and the growing social, social isolation and social poverty that we experience is because of the decline of institutions that supported them. These do not occur uh, randomly. They can occur randomly, but they don't occur at scale on a sustainable, replicable manner unless they're backed by institutions that bring people together or keep people together in some form. And so the big question for me when I think about this is what has changed in our relationships? And I think what I'm going to say initially is going to resonate with a lot of people on this, on this, this, uh, in this conversation on the park bench with us. But where I'm going to land and what I want to conclude, I think, is going to go further than most people at CNU thinking. And I want to encourage people to come with me on this conversation and think harder what they can do to help with our relationship. So this is what we used to have. People you lived in place-based neighborhoods. This could be a town. This could be a part of a city. Uh, this could be a rural area. The point is, is that partly because we did not have cars, partly because this is the way shopping was organized. This is the way people lived their lives around churches. They lived their, their lives around public spaces. They lived their lives around local schools, local businesses. Everything was place-based and it was full of institutions and networks. And for me, a key point is that these were overlapping. You just didn't have one-off experience with one store. You didn't have a one-off experience with one church or one school. You had many experiences in many institutions and many networks, and these overlapped. And so basically what it meant is that we all belong to networks and networks that overlapped, and we belong to these institutions that overlapped, and they supported our social life, and they supported our well-being in various forms. What we have now for the most part is we live in networks. And this is very dynamic. It certainly helps us economically. I think it's made the country um, more fair to a lot of people. The, the extent that place-based structures might have constrained some people, being able to rise up and do well in school and have an opportunity and travel to where that opportunity is, has been tremendously helpful for people that were left behind, individuals. And it's certainly made the country very dynamic. And I think for those that are on the whole, good at navigating networks or that get into the right institutions. Think of the right university, think of the right jobs, think of the right associations, and think of the networks that people uh, create or bring to these places and carry on from these places. Those people are doing very well. But I want us to think about those who live in places that have bad networks or people who are living in places, or maybe individually they have limited or no networks. What this means, whereas people used to have place-based institutions that for the most part encompassed everybody in a place, now we have networks that leave a lot of people behind. They're in the wrong network, they're in a place that have marginalized networks or their whole place is marginalized. And this means that a lot of individuals and a lot of places are being left behind. And I think what we see is that for many Americans, this may not be true in Washington, this may not be true in New York, but it's certainly true for many Americans is we're feeling more anxious, we're feeling more vulnerable, we're feeling more alienated, we're feeling more mistrustful, we're not practicing good relationships, we're not working with other people, we're too much alone, we're too isolated, and if we live in places that are distressed and being left behind, we're probably angry. Uh, one of my chapters is on Eastern Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky, it's hard to go there and see the families and see the state of the of the of the county seats, the, basically the only towns, and see what the landscape looks like because it's very depressing. It's more depressing than many cities. I also have a chapter on Detroit, just to drive around Detroit and see what Detroit is like. I mean, imagine all the people who have been left behind in Detroit, whole neighborhoods have disappeared. 
And literally, uh, these are places where people ought to be mistrustful, ought to be alienated, and ought to be unhappy be simply because of where they live. The best way to see how our change landscape and our change environment is affecting Americans is in the lifespan. Lifespan is not a perfect um, number to see, but the simply it's it's a good proxy for what we're seeing in terms of the well-being of Americans. And our lifespan, uh, besides the fact that it's done awful in the last couple of years because of COVID, look back over 40 years and how it's diverged from comparable countries. I mean, this is the best indicator of the problems people are experiencing in their lives and society. This is huge. And it's enormously different than what is happening in most other developed countries. And this is not affecting our whole population. It's especially affecting particular places that involve uh, people who are, in particular, less educated. But I would say it it has an impact on, on other people as well. And uh, just to give you an indicator, there's over a 40-year gap in terms of your lifespan based upon where you live. And I'm going to get back to that in a second. We also have this recent report on loneliness and isolation. I think it's very important that this has been elevated as a topic. I think what's missing from this conversation is a larger focus on place, a larger focus on place in place-based institutions. And I will get to that right now. So for me, what matters most here, if we're trying to think about what we can do about these problems is that place matters. Uh, uh, there's a great difference in outcomes, as I just mentioned. I mentioned the lifespan differences, but you can look at social mobility. You look at education. You can look at security. You can look at many, many, many social indicators, and they are very place-based. And But I want to also point, and I'll talk about it in a second, is that this is not only a problem of poor people. If you look at the drug overdoses in this country, uh, that is not affecting just poor neighborhoods. That's also affecting many middle-class neighborhoods. So something is happening in poor neighborhoods and something is happening in middle-class neighborhoods that's holding people back or causing uh, lots of uh, bad social outcomes. I mean, this slide from the Center on Developing Child at Harvard is very, it, it really explains it. This would be the same framework that I use in the book is that relationships matter first and foremost. And around that, you have the built and natural environment. So when seeing you people think about the built environment, they really need to be thinking not just about the built environment, but how the built environment affects the social institutions that basically wrap each individual in some sort of support structure. Think of a child. I mean, this is the most extreme case. The more love, I mean, I have children, and you can just see every day, the more love they have, the more safe they feel, the more they feel supported every day, the more likely they're going to flourish or they're going to thrive and they're going to grow up to be to be a successful person. And that social environment is affected by the built environment and by larger policies and culture. But first and foremost, it's a relational issue that depends on institutions. The neighborhood effect is this goes back over 40 years is a well-known effect. And of course, many people here will know Raj Chetty's work about how neighborhoods have great impact on people's outcomes. I wanna tell you that social poverty also affects the well-off. It's very important. Here's a quote from Naomi Schaefer Riley, uh, who works on some of these issues, but you can also hear from David Brooks. You can hear from quite a number of public intellectuals talking about the rise in anxiety uh, and basically this inability to want, this desire to look good to others, meaning that you're unwilling to burden yourself to others, you're unwilling to show vulnerability to others. And the end result of this is that people are more, I would say, more anxious, more vulnerable, and they're basically less capable of dealing with major crises because they've left themselves alone. And when you don't have strong networks and family and neighbors of support, you're much more at risk. So neighborhoods have a huge impact on society and individual well-being. Many of our social ills sit downstream from neighborhoods. We all live in a place, and yet we have built a placeless society that maximizes isolation and vulnerability. I think many at CNU will know that something wrong with our physical landscape. But when we ask ourselves what we can do about it, 
I want to emphasize it's not just about density and it's not just about walkability, which I believe are, are core paradigms of CNU um, members. I want to talk about the fact is we need to, if you want to create environments that nurture uh, strong relationships and strong ties between people, we need to think of bounded neighborhoods. They have a clear identity. They have a clear beginning and end. They have local institutions, community schools. They have businesses. They have a center. They have associations. The more you have uh, this abundance of institutions, this is not just walking. This is not just places to meet, which I think are hugely important. Uh, it's not just shopping. It's about literally associations and activities that bring people together on a recurring basis and creates a lot of spontaneous interaction. In my neighborhood, my neighborhood is like that. I walk down the street and I know most people behind the doors. I know what goes on in their houses to some extent. I've been in their houses. I may not have a lot of friends in my neighborhood, but I have hundreds of people I know in my neighborhood. If I go to a shop or a supermarket near here, I will recognize faces. I will say hi. I will say hi to people on the street. If there's an emergency, and I'll give you one quick story. My daughter dropped her younger brother some years ago on the front cement. He was about two years old. A big emergency was bleeding at the chin. It looked awful. Everybody was in fright. What to do about it? My wife, without asking anyone, without even telling me, picked him up and ran down the street. Why did she run down the street? I discovered later she went to the nearest nurse. She knew where the nearest nurse was, three blocks away, and was there in five minutes, and it was a weekend, and they were home, and we got immediate attention to the problem. It had to go to urgent care and so on and so forth. And we know all the nurses, more or less, in our neighborhood, and ask what would happen to you if you had an emergency like that. That is a neighborhood where you know a lot of people, and it only happens if there's lots of institutions and activities, and it needs a unique identity. These are the types of institutions that exist in neighborhoods. A supportive landscape is what CNU people work on, but I want to emphasize we need to we need to build the landscape to encourage institutions that bring people together, or it will be a lot of people who don't know each other walking down the street uh, by themselves, and that is not creating a more socially interdependent uh, society, which is really what we need. We need social structure, social interdependency, a willingness a desire to know people and be part of people and be like number, I'm at 910, 903, she goes out once a week and she knocks on doors of people who live alone, partly because I think her mother lives alone in my neighborhood. And I just watch her every week walking the streets, visiting these people. The more our neighbors are, are people are just doing that spontaneously, the more we will be successful. So what can strengthen neighborhood relationships of scale? I'm just gonna go a quick story here. Um, this is purpose-built communities, which looks at a comprehensive vision for neighborhoods. Basically, this man here, Tom Cousins, uh, instead of giving grants to lots of organizations that said he was a real estate developer, he was going to work on one neighborhood. He chose East Lake in Atlanta, which everything was awful on the street. People were doing, it was called Little Vietnam. It was a, a pretty um, awful situation. And they have a three-part approach. It's not only the physical, it's the education, community, school, and a lot of wellness. So it's basically lots of local businesses, local shopping, like little gyms, uh, parks. It's three-dimensional. And again, uh, the second and third part of that is very much about institutions. And they set up what's called a, a neighborhood or community quarterback. And so I think if you just build a neighborhood and you don't have mechanisms, it doesn't have to be a neighborhood quarterback, but it's got to be something that 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 it could be a series of institutions that already exist. It could be something you nurture. It could be something you establish, something that nurtures the, the relationship nature of neighborhoods. We always risk building a landscape and people are closer to each other, but they're just walking past each other. These are some questions. I won't go through this. Feel free to look at this. It's described in more detail. I, this is part of my research. It's what I uh, look at, and I look at a lot more detail around these questions, but I wanted to put them here because people probably ask them, 
ask these questions in your work. I mean, just to bring this together, a flourishing society needs to be built on flourishing neighborhoods. We have a lot of big problems in our country, but as Dreama Gentry, who is the focus in her work in Eastern Kentucky, uh, Partners for Education, says, uh, our big problems are best addressed through smaller local solutions. And what can you do? And so my message to CNU people is, um, these are my four messages that I chose specifically for this audience. We need bounded neighborhoods, clear identities, clear boundaries, and they need to be unique. Think about Italian cities. Every place has a unique architecture, has a center, it has a, a, a uniqueness that people know that I'm in this neighborhood and this is places I go to meet people in my neighborhood and I understand what's special about it. It should have its own schools, parks, main streets, meeting places. You do need a diverse range of housing and amenities to ensure a diverse population. And the charrette process, which is an important part of work, should not be one-offs. There should be something, it may not be called the charrette process, but there should be an ongoing way to uh, involve residents and have institutions that are built that nurture collective capacity and collective input into how a neighborhood will evolve. And that will help bring people together. And so this is my book and I look forward to our conversation and the questions that follow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Seth. Um, that was a, uh, a really provocative, uh, presentation. Um, and I want to remind people to use the Q&A function of Zoom um, and uh, think of questions that you want to ask. Um, but in the meantime, um, I want to start off by asking a, a basic question. Uh, people have a, um, a different idea of what a neighborhood is. Uh, um, lots of people think of it um, differently, and there's many different definitions. Um, and new urbanists have their own ideas. So what are your, um, what do you think of, or what are you talking about when you say neighborhood? So I have 10, I have 10 factors. It's not in the, it's not listed, but I would say neighborhood cannot be too large. Uh, I would say it's in the thousands, could be 2,500 people. It could be 5,000 people, probably could be 10,000 people it's not 100,000 people. So we should be clear about the size. Uh, most Americans do not live in neighborhoods. And if, if you read, uh, I, I hear I'm going to promote another book. If you read Emily Talon's book on neighborhoods, which is quite academic, but quite thorough. And, and, um, and she is one of many people, and she's not the only one, uh, who talks about how most of America is built denying the importance of neighborhoods. So I would say a good neighborhood has has an identity, has a beginning and end, has a reasonable size, has a center, has a set of its own institutions. Ideally, it should have a community school. I think it's very underrated how important community schools are. I mean, that, that I, I won't talk about who runs the school, um, but I do think, in my experience, community schools are very important to incubate relationships because if people, kids walk to school and the parents are involved in the school, and there's associations around parents and schools, it's an incredibly good incubator of relationships. So I, I would say that's that. I would say it's really meeting places, third places, could be restaurants. In my neighborhood, we have three restaurants. Uh, we have a supermarket. These are places people can meet. Uh, there's parks. Uh, but the key thing is, it could be libraries, it could be other things. It should, it should if it doesn't have an identity, and it doesn't have a center, and it doesn't have a beginning and end, and it doesn't have institutions and activities that people can gather, it's probably not a neighborhood. If you just have a lot of very nice houses lined up and down the streets, which is typical in American suburbia, and there's no place to meet. I mean, I know neighborhoods 10 minutes from here, houses look nice, there's a lot of green areas, there's trails, there's no place to meet. And because the county is huge, there's no town, there's no level of government. A, an ideal neighborhood should have some civic association. And ideally there should be something about government that's place-based, which is not something we think about, but why not have government have place-based teams instead of just functions? All those things make for stronger neighborhoods in my opinion. 
So a neighborhood really it's it's mixed use. It's got a mixture of people in it. It's not got all the same kind of people. It's really got a whole yes, a yes, whole range of society. It's yes. got public places. It's got third places to meet. These are all things that um, I think that uh, people who are urbanist planners all think about when they think about the neighborhood. These are physical neighborhoods. I mean, it's the place where you live, and it's and it's places connected to that. So why are physical neighborhoods so essential for the well-being of people living there? I think the key thing to understand in our society today is we've built the landscape to isolate us. We've also built institutions to isolate us. If you read de Tocqueville, and I'm not sure how many people here have read de Tocqueville, and you look at what he writes about America, this is almost 200 years ago, but he certainly focused on the abundance of local institutions. If you read more recent work like Bob Putnam, Robert Putnam's books, and uh, other people like him, they will talk about the abundance of local institutions. You can read um, Alan Earnhardt's uh, The Lost City, which describes 1950s and the 1990s Chicago. So people lived in an abundance of formal and informal institutions. And the only way that happens on, on, on a level that affects and incorporates, I mean, people is if it's local. Our nonprofit sector is much more regional and national. It doesn't depend upon local volunteers. It doesn't depend upon local um, resources. Um, our governments are often distant. So whereas people used to be embedded in lots of activities and institutions with their neighbors, and there was a sense of fraternity that we are a member of some organization or multiple organizations or multiple networks, and we had a stake in our place, and we had a sense of agency that we could improve the place and thus improve our lives and also improve the country. That sense of agency that people had in their neighborhoods, today there's like a void. There's the government, there are companies, you drive to shop, uh, you might get served by a nonprofit, um, and uh, government is far away. And what is local? People have lost the sense of agency. They've lost the sense of ownership in society and the country. And I believe the only way to bring people together and make people feel they have a stake in our country is to make neighborhoods central. And that will give lots of institutions to for people to participate in, feel that they can contribute to, and that will increase relationships but also will completely change the way they view where our country is going and what they think of our country. And I think that will not only reduce social problems, it will reduce polarization and mistrust on a larger level. In your book, you identify three kinds of neighborhoods, uh, um, uh, resilient, fragile, and what you call middle neighborhoods. Uh, can you tell me about these types and why they're important? First, I did not invent the term middle neighborhoods. Alan Malik or some, I know Alan Malik has written a lot about that. So I, I don't take credit for that. Um, I'm using the term, and this relates to my work. When I deal with fragile states, I like to work on this continuum. And then I like to talk about the characteristics on, this, on the spectrum. And the goal of my work is basically to help places shift from fragile to robust or resilient and the middle is in between. So a, a robust, strong neighborhood has lots of institutions, have lots of social connectedness, um, have, have basically lots of places where people gather, meet. In the greater Washington area, the, the, I think the most obvious place that, that symbolizes this is a place like Chevy Chase. I yesterday was in Tacoma, which is a, another neighborhood, and not many people might know this, but it's a place with lots of individuals that are volunteering and uh, and involved with government. They start a co-op. They're uh, trying to make this change. They're trying to make that change. So a strong neighborhood may not have everybody activated, but has a lot of people activated, has an abundance of ways for people to feel belonging, to participate. It attracts people to want to move there. And there's a lot going on and you have no shortage of opportunities to feel good about your place, contribute to your place and be involved. If you go to a fragile neighborhood, people are tend to be mistrustful with each other. Uh, their social relationships are weak. Uh, they may be much more transactional. People may be 
there may be people taking advantage of each other. If you're in a wealthy neighborhood, people just are isolating. They don't want to talk to you. They want to hide behind their doors. Uh, they, they do not want to interact. And therefore, you're isolated. You may be in a wealthy neighbor with a lot of nice houses, but you might as well just be living on an island, an island because no one's there to help you. No one's there to support you. And uh, that's not a very good feeling. So that's fragile. Middle neighborhood would be a place in between, maybe not so stressful, maybe not so isolating, uh, but on one hand, but not as supportive with lots of institutions and ways for you to, to belong and contribute. And the middle neighborhood is where the best opportunity is to improve places because a few strategic initiatives could shift that neighborhood more to the robust or strong neighborhood. A very fragile neighborhood is certainly going to have a longer time horizon for change. Um, uh, we're going to get to questions. We've got a lot of them, but um, um, uh, I'm going to ask another um, and directly uh, related to new urbanism. We have the concept of the walkable neighborhood. What is the role of new urbanists in addressing the social problems in America today, in your view? I think walkability is great. I think density is great. I think they're not enough. That's my main message. Uh, just because you live in a dense environment with, with lots of sidewalks and small streets doesn't mean people know each other. It uh, doesn't mean that people are supporting each other. I mean, there's, a, there's a something about this, the, the, the society or the culture of a place that creates that dynamic. So new urbanists are only working on part of a larger puzzle, and I don't expect them to work on the whole puzzle, but to the extent that they build the landscape, this is like the, the second to last slide of my presentation. We don't just build for density and walkability. We should build places that matter, places that have identity, places that have centers. I mean, for me, I'm thinking my neighbor. My neighbor certainly wasn't built to, to be a new urbanistic model because we have basically lots of houses. The center that I talk about is certainly not beautiful. It's on the side. But because we have a lot of institutions, people walk a lot. People go to these places. It so happens that we have community schools. It so happens that we have community parks. Um, I mean, a lot of these things are by accident. But the, one of the keys is we're bounded on three sides by green area. We know where this neighborhood starts and begin. We feel a sense of togetherness. When there's some concern, someone starts a WhatsApp group for my neighborhood. There's a listserv for my neighborhood. There's a civic association for my neighborhood. There's a lots of informal activity around my neighborhood. And so I, I think we can't just build. We have to build with this vision, not just of the built environment. We have to build with the vision of what it means for the built environment to encourage this type of social dynamic. And I've tried to give specific suggestions. It's not just about density and walkability. It's about fostering the sense of place, the sense of uniqueness. Uh, each place should have a name. Each place should have places to gather. Each place should have a center. Each place should have institutions uh, and so on and so forth. The more we build so that we each live in a village, we want to villasize. I'm not sure that's a great word, but the more the landscape looks like a, a, a chain of villages that are connected, but each of them are separate, I think the more we will nurture relationships at scale. Uh, I'm going to sort of take these questions um, uh, one one at a time in order. Many of them are good. Um, and I can go as long as as long as we need to here, Rob, as you know. I'll stay as long as people want to keep asking questions. Okay. Well, uh, Jordana asks, uh, do you have any concerns about creating a delineated neighborhood that um, that, that might create friction and division? Well, if that neighborhood was gated and it only had wealth, wealthy people in it, I mean, people have created that landscape in many parts of the country. And one of our problems of neighborhoods, there's the, the racial problem, but there's also the class problem. I think so many people who are at the top of our society, they live separate from everybody else, the part of the country they live, the type of place they live, how much do they interact with the rest of us? And I think that is that is a serious challenge. So to the extent that neighborhoods are exclusive, 
on any of those lines. Um, I would also say political. Uh, we want neighborhoods to nurture diversity. We want neighborhoods to work on building bridges, both within neighborhoods and across neighborhoods. I don't want to say that to build delineated neighborhoods means that they are going to be isolated from other neighborhoods. That's certainly not what I mean. But to the extent that they're strong and they have their own identity and they're connected elsewhere, they can create bridging mechanisms within and they can create bridging mechanisms to other places and to government. I mean, again, it depends on how you're designing mixed income housing and uh, an opportunity for people from multiple classes and multiple backgrounds to live in a place that will not that that I think is the way forward just to address any concerns over exclusion or anything like that. Now, Tina asks, how, how do you define institution? Um, and I I was thinking about this as, as you were talking, but uh, new urbanists often think about uses, uses that are needed in a neighborhood. Um, what kind of institutions are you talking about that really should be provided in every neighborhood? So we, we, need, to, we need to remember institutions are formal and informal. So a school is a type of institution, uh, uh, a parent teachers association or a church or a store, uh, these are all um, these are all institutions. I would say that we need to have a broader definition. We need to think about the formal and the informal. So uh, people who who I mean, I'm thinking of my neighbor again. I'm at nine ten. I have a neighbor at nine o three. She goes around knocking on the doors of people every week who are alone. I mean, that's not an institution in itself. But if she does that, and then it leads other people to do that. And then it becomes the norm. Remember, institutions also mean norms. So to the extent that she creates a pattern that leads to many people doing that, that becomes an institution. The interfamily network, something that's very rarely talked about in any circle that I'm familiar with in America um, on these problems, interfamily networks are hugely important to the well-being of any household, however we want to define family. Uh, it could be multi multi generational families. It could be a, a single mother. Whatever it is, uh, interfamily networks are huge. The stronger interfamily networks are, that is an institution. Um, if you go back and you look at America before the '60s, you look at, um, at like Robert Putnam or Alan Earhart's work. They will talk about all the types of institutions, and some of these were just. Uh, I mean, if you read Jane Jacobs, uh, the institution was people were on the on the front of their buildings watching the streets and the streets were safe because there were eyes on the streets. And if a lot of people do that, that becomes an informal institution that people are there. They have a sense of stake in the place and they're there to take care of each other. That becomes an institution as well. I mean, in the way we live in America today, no one watches the street. Nobody cares for each other's kids. And the, the norm is just hide in your house, uh, get on your screen, and don't talk to anybody else. So I want to argue an institution that would be good is let the kids go on the street and let people have eyes on the streets, and let's have some sort of co-ownership of our neighborhood. And that in itself is a type of institution. So I think we need to think about this term very broadly, and I think it affects how we think about design very much so. Um, so the new urbanists have um, often are working in uh, suburban areas. We have this concept of uh, suburban retrofit or sprawl repair. Um, and uh, a large amount of our metro areas are uh, are suburban in form. And uh, so uh, there is a question, is, is there any way to ad adapt suburban communities to your vision of what a good neighborhood is? And how would you suggest doing that? It's a huge challenge, of course. Our country has been built to isolate us. I think anyone who believes in new urbanism understands that is that is what we have done to ourselves. I, I think it's important to think it's not only physical, it's institutional. It works on both levels, uh, how we even design uh, whatever institutions we have. But if I'm thinking about what to do in a neighborhood, I mean, certainly multifunction zoning, certainly to the extent that we can create that we that we look at the physical landscape and we uh, delineate 
what is this is one neighborhood this is another neighborhood this is another neighborhood and to the extent that we can build centers i mean i'm outside washington i think it's a somewhat imperfect example but there clearly is a plan to dent to densify around all the metro stations so all the metro stations there's been apartment buildings there's been an increase in shopping to the extent that that's a center my neighborhood is smaller than that to the extent that there's a center so what i would be doing is i'd be delineating the landscape i'd be looking for ways to create places to meet it could be some neighborhood hub it could be some uh, places where um, people could have activities. Is there a park? You got to start with something. You always got to start somewhere and you got to think this is a long-term endeavor. It's going to be incremental. Let's at least delineate by neighborhood. Let's look for places that could be centers. Let's think about what institutions can be established there. Let's think about creating places where people can gather I mean, all these things are just a starting point. Um, I think it's really hard because I know there's so many neighborhoods. They they look attractive, but they're basically house, 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 house. And there's nothing that brings the people together. Maybe in a cul-de-sac, you know your neighbors. Maybe if you have kids, you might know someone else in the neighborhood with kids. But you could live there, drive everywhere, and never know a single person. And that's, that's like scary to me. And there's no, nothing like that exists almost anywhere else in the world. So I, I would just start where you can and think about, uh, uh, again, the map and then about places and then about incrementally changing these places so that they can have uh, institutions and activities in those neighborhoods where people can come together. I want to get back to these, uh, you know, to the institutions um, that you keep talking about and, and drill a little bit deeper, because uh, new urbanists, when they're often they're planning neighborhoods, they're doing future planning for neighborhoods and they're thinking of uses and they're often thinking of the school and they're thinking of the church and the park and the main street. But what else? I mean, what should they, they really be thinking of in terms of institutions if they're getting creative? What are the most uh, should should they be thinking uh, more deeply about what institutions should be planned for? Um, if you're trying to create a successful neighborhood, a strong neighborhood. Again, of course, the challenge, of course, is the best neighborhoods, nobody planned uh, some of the most important informal institutions. People generate them organically day in and day out. I mean, I'm thinking of um, I'm thinking of um, my daughter's best friend. My daughter is in sixth grade and she underwent chemo this year and uh, lost all of her hair, missed a lot of school. And then the neighborhood, I mean, we have a community school, but I'm just thinking the school, the neighborhood, people came together around the family, people came together around the kid. Um, and in many ways, the year was a good experience because so many people supported her and her family. That is a type of we have a norm in my neighborhood that we do those things and you can't build for that. So this is a really challenging question. But I would say, again, if we go back to this original vi vision that people, people, for all of human history, people lived in something like village-like conditions. And those villages had certain things and those certain things, those institutions overlapped and they incubated a lot of other institutions that we don't see on the map. So if I'm doing this, again, it's not about just building what you described, those schools and places to shop. I think it's about bounding the neighborhood. So there's a clear start and clear finish. Creating, if the, You could create some sort of civic center. I don't know if that's a government center. I don't know if that's a, a center for organizations to gather. Um, things like that. So it's not just shopping and retail. Uh, the thing is, every place needs to have its own institutions. If everyone is driving to a church that's not nearby, I mean, I was in Tacoma with this friend of mine uh, yesterday, and he was saying a lot of people in his church live there, but the church actually is in a different place. And so that is, I mean, someone mentions Blue Zone. So Blue Zones probably has, uh, they have very good institutions and they have very good relationships. So I would just talk about you're building so that these places are local 
and that you're encouraging people to come together. And it's not just about a center shopping district and things like that. It's much more than that. I would also say that you want to build uniqueness. What is the what is the name of this place? What is going to be special about this place? Why are people going to feel that that this is a really unusual, interesting place? Is it because of the nature? Is it because of the architecture? Is it because something about the arts that we're doing here? I mean, it's hard to put your finger on one thing, but if every place has some unique quality and has things to celebrate and have places in the center where people are wanting to come and gather and they can incubate a lot of other things, not just, not just people meet and go home, got to be incubating more sustained relationships. The one specific suggestion I would make is the charrette process, which from what I mostly see is not a continuous process. Could that be a tool to bring people together on an ongoing basis? People talk about um, associations or association of associations in the neighborhood. To the extent that you have some ongoing process that people are in, a lot of people are engaged with, to improve the neighborhood and creates a lot of interaction around people, that by itself would be a type of institution that could be left as a legacy for the neighborhood. We have a uh, like a specific question uh, that 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 deals with uh, you know a specific type of neighborhood and how do you encourage the generation of neighborhood characteristics you're championing if the neighborhood is built out and um, bordered on other sides by neighborhood resources and institutions and these institutions are located across primary local roads um, and the neighborhood contains none of them in its own boundaries um, that's a little complicated but that's hard that's a hard one it's very it, typical of america america is built to drive from point a to point b and go shopping America is not built for people to meet in a neighborhood and to thrive in socially where you live. That's how we built the country. That's why we have these problems. So, uh, I mean, I can answer that. I mean, again, uh, my neighborhood, as an example, basically on one side of the neighborhood, there's a small shopping mall. And I think if my neighborhood wasn't strong, that shopping mall would wither and people would go further afield. And she only had a number of supermarkets that came in and did not succeed. And they closed, and the same with some stores. It happens to be my neighborhood is pretty strong. Uh, so if you were on the edge, if there was some shopping on the edge, I would certainly be asking, could the shopping there be more walkable? Could that shopping area be more connected to the neighborhood? Could somehow that neighborhood and that shopping be more, not only more connected, but have it be that shopping for that neighborhood? It could be that the center is not physically in the center, it could be on the edge, but because it was easy to reach to, it was very it was very uh, dynamic that people wanted to spend time there. And it was maybe somewhat, um, it could be two neighborhoods with one center. I mean, that's not ideal, but it could be you have neighborhood on each side with the one center and that center was more dense and that center was more focused on like a neighborhood hub and more more of these institutions, not just shopping. Uh, and it was designed to encourage the connection of neighborhoods on one or both sides to it. That would be a way to start. Um, Noah asks, uh, one hard part uh, of a neighborhood creation as a planner is they're creating facsimiles of the things that you're talking about. Um, uh, and there's boundaries for neighborhoods, uh, there's walls, there's property boundaries, uh, there's um, non-government organizations, HOAs, parents groups, etc. However, these are clearly not in a form that is producing real community in many cases. How do we work with this reality um, that planners are dealing with and found in many communities and uh, to, to try to create stronger neighborhoods? I think one of the challenges we have is that a lot of associational life in America used to be neighborhood or place-based, and now it's not. They're like networks. They're like what I would call functional networks to achieve specific goals. Um, I would say the more the institutions or the boundaries, for example, a primary school, if a primary school 
the, the the area that students come from to that primary school maps onto a neighborhood, well, that's helpful because then the PTA of that school and any parent involvement or student involvement with that school will match the neighborhood. I think too much of our landscape, we built these associations or these institutions to be place, to be divorced from place. And I, I think that's what's being described here. So I would certainly look to think about how we can encourage those to be more. When I speak to church leaders, for example, my argument is your churches need to be more place-based. They need to be more communal. You have to stop thinking of yourself as a consumer product that people come in for two hours and then leave. And then maybe you're offering a few services. So I, I would be, again, this is beyond the scope of some of the some of the people's work here, but to the extent that these institutions match neighborhoods, they won't be geared towards building community, but they will organically incubate it, as opposed to if they're far-flung networks across many places, they're much more likely to be transactional and focused only on a specific function. If you had six, seven of those institutions and they were all based on one neighborhood, they would still have that function, but then they would be overlapping and they would be incubating lots and lots of spinoff relationships. That's what we don't have in our society. We're not incubating spinoff institutions, spinoff uh, relationships. All these networks are, are, for the most part, very functional. And they and they and they leave a great void in people's lives because of that. Uh, the neighborhood that I just uh, left, actually, and I was living in for twenty five years, we had. Um, you're, you're talking about sort of the spontaneous uh, uh, creation of neighborhood institutions, but somebody had the idea in two thousand and seven to get all of the uh, the performers and the musicians playing um, in the neighborhood at one time on one date. Great and idea. They called it Porch Fest, and it has uh, since spread around the country. But that is an institution that has really created a lot of community in that neighborhood. I personally met a lot of uh, good, very good friends at um, in that one institution that takes place annually. Um, uh, so there's it I, incubates it incubates relationships and in other institutions. It does. It incubates relationships and uh, in a way that really nothing else does, uh, um, because there's it creates shared experience among people. Um, so those kinds of institutions, perhaps we don't think about as planners, but they can make a neighborhood stronger. Um, yes. Yes. So the extent that we create hubs or places for them, that would be very helpful. Right. In this case, the hub is the porch and its porch is scattered around the neighborhood. <laughs> um, so it's kind of. I, 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 I wonder how that works in the winter time. I hope it works well then, too. Well, it's only it's it's once a year and it happens okay. in September, <laughs> which is the best uh, weather that we have in, in upstate New York. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, but if you can make use of these porch, I mean, in porches, uh, oftentimes people don't do anything in the winter. We meet shoveling snow, but um, but porches are, I think, um, a, a real asset to a neighborhood. If you make use of them, if people actually hang out on their porches, if when weather is, is allowed, I mean, um, weather allowing. But this is an institution it kind of supercharges the power of the porch. If people take advantage, I'll use, in my neighborhood, we don't have porches, but when COVID struck, people started putting chairs in front of their house. They're still there in many cases. People put chairs in front of their house and people would meet in front of houses. And in my neighborhood, we have carports. Now, I never heard of a carport. I'm from the Northeast and everyone had a garage. And here they have carports, which is a funny, funny, funny architectural thing. But people started putting couches in their carports. And when the weather became cold, they put heating units. So people would meet outdoors with the heating unit covered by the carport. And the thing is, people just found ways to to um, to meet people because we are connected to each other. When you live in a place where people are connected to each other, they will find ways to 
be connected. And whenever there's a crisis, they come together. And I think for me, when I look at America, too few places are like this. And we have to think as des urban designers and um, planners, we need to think um, and um, any anywhere in our country, we have to think about how do we make this much more the DNA of every neighborhood. So we're at the hour mark and, and uh, we're going to be posting this video on CNU's website uh, probably tomorrow. And, and people, if they have to go, they can... Uh, uh, watch the full video when it, when it is posted or, or see your questions answered. Um, we can talk a little more, um, uh, maybe uh, answer a few more questions. Um, um, and uh, there was a question that had to do with renters. What about neighborhoods, neighborhood health with the increasing trend of renters? This is a, a real estate trend um, that more people are renting. Um, uh, rather than home buying, it's probably going to change the mix in a lot of neighborhoods. Uh, um, do you have any thoughts on, on creating strong neighborhoods, resilient neighborhoods where you have more um, renters, a higher proportion of renters than, than homeowners? I think that uh, home ownership does make people feel a greater stake, but I, I think it's not owning or renting that matters. It's a commitment to a place. Uh, a strong neighborhood typically has turnover of let's say five or 6% a year. A fragile neighborhood can have 20, 25% turnover. I mean, those are very approximate. Every place is different. So if you're a renter, I mean, I'm my neighborhood, I looked for a neighborhood to move to before I chose my neighborhood. And then I rented for several years before I was willing to buy. I wanted to make sure I had the right choice. And then I wanted to know where in the neighborhood I wanted to live. And we do have people who rent, even though a lot of people own. I think the key thing is uh, that turnover rate matters a lot. If you have 20, 25% turnover, it's very hard to build institutions. It's very hard for schools to do well. Um, that's much more common in distressed neighborhoods. But any place that has high turnover, it's a problem. So I'm not sure renting itself is the problem. It might make the relationship with the neighborhood more transactional. And it might make people more, more likely to leave. But if a place is dynamic and exciting, it could be the stepping stone to buying. And um, I can think of somebody I know who moved to uh, some neighborhood in Connecticut. They were only planning on renting for a year. Uh, but it so happens they so love the neighborhood. She was commuting, I think, an hour and a half to NYU to teach. And she so loved the neighborhood that they ended up buying. So renting... Uh, could 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 go many ways. I think the most important thing is long term commitment and the amount of turnover you have in the neighborhood. Okay. Um, Tina asks, uh, have you seen examples of a charrette process that is ongoing and connected to um, a local neighborhood or a local institutions or something like a charrette process that's uh, that's doing that or performing that function? When I was in Charlotte, I talked to several people about this, and I myself, not, not being in the new urbanist field, am less familiar with this than people who spend their lives working on this issue. But several people, when I talked to them, because I was specifically asking about this, said there were examples of a charrette process being converted into some ongoing. What I think would be a more general case is some sort of neighborhood association. If you look at purpose-built communities and what they what they did in East Lake and elsewhere is they work with some sort of neighborhood association and they seek out, I know a lot of people who work on neighborhoods, They the ones that do it well, they look for or they create some platform where people can come together where they have some method of inquiring about what the needs and the desires of people are they include them in some degree. I mean, I have a chapter on an organization in Detroit, which is not building, it's building a neighborhood hub. It's not changing the physical landscape. And that organization had a lot of trouble when it first went into that neighborhood in Detroit because it didn't build relationships. It didn't build trust. And it was seen as an outsider and it, was, it wasn't welcomed. And then that person had to make a course correction and learn that it, he had to make break bread he had to hire people from the local community. He had to create, um, uh, meet the, the senior people or the most respected people in the neighborhood. 
and eventually had to create an advisory board. So he went through a whole learning process and established a series of relationships and institutions around his work to ensure that it would be directed to a certain extent owned by the neighborhood and it would be it would be well enmeshed in the neighborhood. So I think anyone who's doing a project, uh, especially if it's in an existing neighborhood with high levels of mistrust, should 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 have to follow a similar process to what uh, Life Remodeled did in Detroit. And it's about building trust. It's about working with people. It's about establishing whether it's a charret or some sort of advisory network or advisory board. And that board did not dissolve when his project was up and running. That board continues. It meets regularly. Uh, they discuss various issues. And in fact, they established two boards, one of the senior statesmen and one of students because they particularly want to appeal to students. So they literally have a board of students getting their feedback as well. So I, I think there's many ways to do this and it can be ongoing and could be very helpful. Um, uh, you know, as a new urbanist practitioners, uh, planners, um, they're often gathering data on places because this is part of the process of getting to know a place before you do a plan. Um, but it may focus on economic data. You know, the, that's the obvious stuff to, to get demographic and economic data. But you advise people gathering data uh, to focus on things like social norms, family dynamics, and the quality of local institutions. Um, why is that? And how do you gather this sort of uh, information. It's very important that we, we use data, but we have to use the right data. And I think for the most part, we tend to use material or economic data. And I certainly think that's important if people are homeless or people are poor or people, uh, something's wrong with their houses. I mean, this is all important, but I want to encourage people to think that flourishing has a material and a social dimension. My book purposely set aside most or all of the economic issues. It, it comes up from time to time, but I was trying very hard not to focus on the material because a lot of people have focused on the material. And I feel that there's very little focus on what can we do to improve relationships? That's what I wanted to write about. That's, if you ask me my obsession every night, I'm, I'm uh, trying, to, trying to deal with this one question is, how can our relationships be better so our societies will be more, will thrive more? That's what I've done for 20 years. And, and so I, those indicators, I would think that people would need material indicators as well. But I focus on those because I think those are examples of, of social flourishing. And, and they're not always easy to gather. You could surely measure the, 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 the density of institutions. You surely could do something to measure the nature of relationships. I mean, some of this might be surveys, could be something that you do a desktop, some of it might be asking people. You surely could be looking at data on at the household level and then at the neighborhood level to try to figure out what is going on in terms of institutions on multiple levels. Some of this can be found easily. Some of it requires more work. Uh, there are people who have spent a, a lot of time thinking about this. If you look at the Rod Shetty work, he clearly was able, not at the neighborhood level, but he was able to get this data at the zip code level. So this data uh, is out there and there's different ways to find proxies for it. And if people wanted to know more, I mean, they should, I'm happy to answer this, but I would certainly create a scorecard and I mean, the material may matter on one side, the social may matter on the other side. And I would encourage people to look for uh, either the, the things that I mentioned or proxies, some of it's available online, some of it's available through government, some of it only comes out once a year, but these are things that we certainly can find and we certainly can look at and gives us at least some sense about how well a neighborhood is doing. I mean, I would look at local businesses, local businesses, it's economic, but it relates to also creating uh, relationships because local businesses, local restaurants, local associations, all of this uh, do relate as well of the things that Rob mentioned. 
Okay, well, I think we've gotten to the uh, the end of our questions. Uh, this has really been a stimulating discussion. Clearly, uh, um, urbanists and planners have a lot to learn about how to create stronger neighborhoods in a way that's uh, you know beyond just the physical aspects of the neighborhood and how those two can be linked together. But this has been a, uh, a really interesting discussion. Thank you, uh, Seth, for doing this with us. And thanks for uh, reaching out to CNU and being part of the Congress this year. Um, so, uh, um, you know, we will, um, I guess people can, can get in touch with you if they have additional- please, please find me. They can find me at my website, sethkaplan.org. They can find me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to- answer any follow-up questions and I'd be happy to continue the conversation any in any way it would be. So thank you so much. And it's a, it's an honor and a pleasure because I think so highly of your work and the work of this field. Okay. Thank you, Seth. And thanks everybody who, uh, uh, who tuned in and, and took part. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you.